All right, let's go to the Lord. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity we have this morning. God, to study your word. Um, let everyone here who has ears hear what you're saying in here, not just the words, but to understand the meaning behind those words. God, and help us understand what you would have for us in, in your gospel as you wrote it, as John wrote it, as you inspired him to do. Um, God, let us put all those anxieties or anything else we have in our mind aside this morning so that we can only hear from you. And, and God, I ask that even me, even if you would push me out of the way so that we can only hear from you, um, that's what we want more than anything this morning. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Gospel of John. Let's talk about context, okay? I always ask Libby if I can do the background for this reason because I love it, and I'll tell you why I love it is because you can't understand the Gospels. You can't understand anything in the Bible without knowing the context of it, right? Right. I'm, I'm telling you, right. Right. <laughs> We're going to be a little interactive here at, here at first. So what we know, what do we know? Who wrote the Gospel of John? John. So y'all are already studying. How do we know that? <laughs> Bible tells us so, right? So before we get started, I'm going to, you two will know this already. There are three things you have to know before you start studying scripture. If you have a pen, get it out. Right now, get it out. You can jot this down on the side of anything, I promise, real quick. You're not getting your pen out. Oh, okay. All right, number one thing you need to know when studying scripture, anything. Context. Context. We have to know the context. Write that down. <laughs> number two thing you need to know when you start studying scriptures. Context. <laughs> Anybody want to take a stab at number three? Context, absolutely. Context. If you want to add a fourth, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Okay, so why is context so important? Because it changes the entire meaning of whatever you're reading. In this case, we're talking about John, right? So if we don't know who John is, and I don't mean just his name is John, we don't know who John is or what significance he has in this story. Why, why did he write a gospel? Who is he? Why do we care who he is, right? Um, then we can't understand the significance of the words and the reason he was inspired by God to do this, right? So we talk about uh, the gospel of John. Let's talk about John the human first, right? What do we know about him? We know he was one of the 12 disciples, right? We, we're fairly certain by all accounts that he was the youngest disciple. Why do we know that? Uh, because of how long he lived. He was actually the only disciple that wasn't violently martyred. He actually lived to an old age, and by all counts, we assume he lived to be, or we, that he lived to uh, around 90 to 100 AD. Um, so by the time he was following Jesus, he was a very young man. We're talking a teenager. We're talking, some of you probably have teenagers or have had teenagers. We're talking somebody like Peyton's age, following Jesus. He was called by Jesus to follow him. Um, so he was a very young man when he started following Jesus. Why is that important? Because we're talking about a kid here. Right? We're talking about a kid that was called by God to follow Jesus. That's very important to know. Uh, what else do we know about him? We know he has a brother named James. Not the same James that wrote the book of James. That's a different James. But we know that these two are in the fishing business together, which they probably learned from their father, Zebedee. I've had to practice saying that because otherwise it sounds like Zebedee. <laughs> and then you're like, what, what are you saying? Um, anyways, we know that their father was a wealthy man. He was a wealthy fisherman who obviously taught that trade to his boys. Uh, we know that these boys, John and James, were both part of Jesus' inner circle, along with Peter, another fisherman that they often went fishing with and had, had trades with. Uh, all these things can be found in Scripture. I could give you tons and tons of references. They're all in here, but we don't have time for that, right? Um, so Libby's back there laughing at me. Um, anyways, what we know, those are things we know about John the human, right? We know, we know we had a brother. We know that, oh, that's another thing that we know. We know that Jesus once termed he and his brother the sons of thunder, which sounds like a pretty cool, pretty cool nickname, right? Or a biker gang or something. But, but think about it. And he called them that because both of them were very passionate. And when I say passionate, they were very intolerant. They're very impatient. They, they would get mad on a whim, and they'd say, hey, you need to call down fire from heaven to these people because they're, they're disrespecting you, talking to Jesus. And Jesus is going, 
this is not the message I'm here for. I'm I'm here in peace. You're 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 too much right now. Sons of thunder, you're you're big boom and bang on the ground. You need to calm down. Right? And even despite all those things, Jesus knew all those things. Obviously, he nicknamed them that. Um, he also knew that John was also a very compassionate man. He was he was a learner, he was somebody who would follow, he was somebody uh, that Jesus could trust. In fact, uh, John was the one that Jesus trusted with his mother after he died. He knew he was going to die, of course. And he's the one, he came to John and said, John, I want you to take care of Mary, my mother, somebody that he adored. And let's go back to that young man thing. How many of you would leave your mother in the care of a teenager, right? That says something about this guy. So now that we know a little more about John, let's talk about the gospel of John. We have four gospels, right? John's the last one. When I say it's the last one, the first three are the things are the gospel that we call the synoptic gospels. Why? Because they give us a synopsis of who Jesus was. They're very factual. They tell us about his life. They all start, generally, they all start with a peasant girl with an immaculate conception giving birth in a manger. There's no room at the inn. We know all this, all these stories, right? And then we go through the parables, the teachings, the ministry, the the mission around Galilee, that's where those gospels focus. They give us a lot of information about Jesus. And one of the the things that God graces us with through those three gospels, those other three gospels, is that we have different accounts of the same story. So if you read each of those, you see a lot of overlapping stories. But because we're talking from three different people, they're all all at the same place at the same time, but the, the thing that they're most focused on is different. So it also helps us give, um, give some uh, credibility to this story because they all saw the same thing. They all experienced the same thing. But the thing that stuck with them is different for each of them, right? But then you have John. John comes out of left field, right? He doesn't start with there was a peasant girl on, on the way to Nazareth. There was, <laughs> there was in the beginning. And if you think it's any coincidence that it starts in the beginning, you were absolutely wrong. John, John focuses on Jesus in Jerusalem. So we're, we're not in Galilee anymore. He starts, bam, Jesus is already an adult. He's already the Christ, right? And that's his whole purpose in writing. And I wish I'd written this scripture down. There's, um, you might know it actually. Come here. <laughs> so there's a there's a thesis statement in John a lot of course any writer in the Bible has a purpose for why they wrote what they wrote right other than of course they're inspired by God but why did God choose them what's their purpose well John makes it very clear and I think it's in John 20 Libby 2031 John 2031 he said and I'm going to paraphrase here um, he says he literally lays it out he says I wrote this so that you might believe and have eternal life in him That's why I wrote this, so that you might believe and have eternal life in him. And as we go through this, we'll get to that. um, Thank you for that, by the way. We'll we'll get to chapter 20, of course, next semester, because this is a very long book. Um, When we get to that part, uh, you'll notice that that is right after uh, he talks about the resurrection. And why I'm telling you that now is because we get through all these things that Jesus did. He goes through all these signs and miracles and wonders. And then we get down to him saying, I wrote this so that you might believe. It's not a far stretch for him to say, listen, if anything's going to convince you that this man, this is is the guy, this is the Messiah. You've waited 400 years to hear from God. You heard from him. He's here. He's the Messiah. This is is the one. If anything is going to convince you of that, it's going to be the fact that he was a dead man and that tomb is empty, right? I get real fired up about this. (laughs) Thanks. I get real fired up about this um, because we're we're not talking. This wasn't a hoax. This wasn't a magic trick. This was a guy that was good and dead. They stuck him in a tomb. He was there for three whole days, and then he wasn't. Right. So if anything is going to convince you that he is he is the Christ, the Messiah, it's that. And that's I think that's John's point there in saying that is that you have to believe that he is the Messiah. And to believe that, you have to believe in the resurrection. And I know it's, it's not a far stretch for us even now to have a hard time understanding, or maybe not understanding, but uh, coping with the idea of a resurrection. Because, I mean, we've been to funerals. They ain't coming back, right? They're gone. 
But that's not the case with the Messiah. And that's, that's John's point throughout his whole gospel is to explain the deity of Christ. Not just the man. We get a lot of that from the other three gospels. But John writes with, uh, Libby and I were talking about this, it is full of theology. Full of theology. And if I've seen some eyes glaze over at theology, it's kind of a boring word. I get it. Uh, But it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be, really. Once you get into it and you understand more about what theology truly is, it's not. It's not a boring word. It'll get you excited, and then you'll start reading through it, and you'll be like, oh, my gosh, am I a Bible nerd now? And I'm going to say, yes, and you should come see me because we can nerd out together. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Um, Anyways, so uh, John, he's chock full of theology and, and great teachings, and that's his whole point is so that you would believe so that I would believe so that we would believe let that sink in let it sink in he wrote this whole book and it's you'll notice it's a lot longer than the other three gospels presumably because the other three you know back then they wrote on parchment on scrolls right so the other three are roughly the same length presumably because they used up an entire scroll and they were done John kept going he said no I'm not done yet he kept going because he had a point to make And we'll get to a point where it seems like his gospel's over. And this is why my point in telling you this is that we assume, trying to answer some of those W questions for you, we assume that he started writing this gospel between 60, 70 AD. Why do we assume that? Because there is no mention of the siege of the Jewish temple, which happened in 70 AD. And that was such a significant event that it's just too far-fetched probably to assume he wouldn't have mentioned it at all if it had already happened. However, we also know that it was widely circulated several years later in 90 to 100 AD, right? Which is also around the time, those of you who have studied the Revelation study or have done this Revelation study before, you'll know. It's also about the time that he was inspired to write Revelation on the island of Patmos. That's another book that John wrote. It's another thing we know about John, right? He wrote Revelation. He wrote three letters in addition to his gospel. Um, But of course, today we're only focusing on the gospel of John. So how am I doing? How am I doing? Oh, we're doing good. Y'all, y'all can keep listening to me. Okay, so my other, the other thing I really wanted to get through this morning, um, there's 34 verses y'all are going to go through in your small groups, but the first 18, wow, right? We call that's the prologue of the gospel of John. Um, and man, it is chock full of stuff. Just It starts out in the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and it's a capital word. It's not just the word. It's a capital word. And so you read that first sentence, and I'm sure a lot of you had questions just like I did, and you're going, you're saying this man was a book. Is that what we're getting at here? Is this a fairy tale? No. This is in the beginning. He's paralleling exactly what Genesis told us. In the beginning. He's saying that even before Christ was here on earth on foot, He was in the beginning. He was a part of the Godhead way before we even knew there was a Godhead, right? We talk about the Old Testament. They hear from God all the time. Then the New Testament, we have Jesus, right? And we're saying even before the New Testament, and that's John's point, before the New Testament, before that guy was born in a manger, he was here. He was a part of this plan. He was part of God. So we talk about God. We talk about the Godhead, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's getting at with this. And trust me, if you had trouble going through this prologue, you're in good company. There have been uh, historians and theologians I've very studied, so I've read all this, um, that have, <laughs> that have um, this has been a debate. It kept Christian theologians busy for a long time. We're talking hundreds of years trying to understand not just that first sentence, but that whole, those whole uh, first 18 verses of the prologue. What does this mean? It's, and he starts talking about John the Baptist, and you're going, where did that come from? Why is he, where did he come from? Out of nowhere. Um, but I want you to notice, if you haven't already, there are two words that recur a lot in those first 18 verses. And those are the word life and the word light. And when we think about the condition of our world, just the way we're born into it, which has always been the condition of the world, we think of the antonyms of those, right? In Christ, there is life and there is light. Without him, there's no life. There's darkness. Now, there may be biological life, 
I'm not saying you can't be born without Jesus in your life, but you're not living that eternal life, which is his whole purpose for writing this gospel, right? So take note of those two things. Um, we also get into John the Baptist. Um, this is another fascinating thing. I'm trying to condense all my, all my thoughts here. John, we talk about John the Baptist in these first 34 verses, and he, he's baptizing, and of course, people come to him going, who are, are you? Are you Elijah? Now I'm not Elijah. Why did they ask that? Why did they ask that? Well, because in Malachi, which is the last prophet that we had before we didn't hear from God for 400 years, he said, the Christ will come when Elijah says he's coming. Okay. Fair question. Are you Elijah? He said, no. No, I'm not. Was he Elijah? Technically, no. Was he fulfilling that prophecy? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it wasn't lying, saying he wasn't Elijah. He's not. He's John the Baptist. Um, but he did fulfill that prophecy in that he came exactly as Elijah would, out of the woods, starts baptizing people and saying, he who comes after me is actually preferred before me. Right? And the other thing they ask is, are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? Now, you and I had that written down our first time we looked at this. Um, who is the prophet? Does anybody know who we're talking about? Any guesses? Nothing? Nobody? Okay. Yes, exactly. The one that's mentioned in Deuteronomy, which would be our friend, Moses. Right? Moses. Why did they ask that? Same reason, because back in Deuteronomy, it tells you. Moses will be the guy to usher in the Christ. Fair question. All of this was a fair question, right? And John the Baptist answers kind of similarly to how Jesus would, right? And kind of a parable type of, type of response saying, I'm not this guy. I'm here to usher him in. I'm here to build a highway for him to come through because he's coming. And you guys aren't even ready. And I'm sure you can imagine these people are going, what do you mean I'm not ready? Yes, I am. Don't tell me how to live my life, right? And he's going, no, I'm telling you. You're, I'm here baptizing, building this highway for him to come in on because you're not ready. And I'm telling you that because you're unclean. You're unclean. Whoa. Right? That was, that was offensive. Right? That was scandalous. That was something they did not want to hear. What do you mean I'm unclean? You're unclean. You're not worthy. This is John the Baptist who says, I'm not worthy to lose his sandal, which was something that was specifically reserved for slaves. He says, I'm not worthy to be this man's slave. And you think that you're worthy to be in his presence? No, not a chance. So that's what John the Baptist was there for. And we talk about this. You'll, hopefully you talk about this in your small groups. Um, just making the way for the Christ. And John starts it out like that with Jesus already as an adult. And, of course, we know John the Baptist ends up baptizing him, too. Um, John starts out like this because then he moves straight into the other signs, straight into the other miracles, straight into all of these things that, that he tells you why, why these things came to pass, what the significance is, what the point is, how, you know, this isn't just he does, you know, Jesus is here doing some cool magic tricks, and it looks, looks nice, right? He turned water into wine. woo -hoo! You know? No, he's saying... You're, you're missing the point. If all you're seeing is, you know, something miraculous, you're missing the point. You need to understand what just took place here. And that's actually the point of those three things I told you earlier, context, context, context. That's the point there, so that you'll understand the point, so that you'll know why this was written, so that you'll understand not just who John is, but why do we have another gospel? What's the, what's the point in having another gospel? Well, it's like I said, we have a lot of facts about Jesus. We need to know more theology here. We need to understand this man, Jesus, right? If we're going to believe in him, I mean, that's not the only reason we should, right? But that was John's point is that if you're going to believe in him, I'm going to give you a series of reasons you should. I'm going to tell you he was the guy you're looking for, the people that, I mean, we know Jewish people today are still watching for a Messiah, right? And, and too bad they haven't read this verse from John, I suppose. It says, if anything's going to convince you, this is it. This is your guy. This is the Messiah. This is the one who was charged to come and judge the world. And here's another fun fact for you. Um, Jesus often refers to himself as the son of man. 
right? I think that's actually in here in these first verses, maybe. Um, and he does that, and I think often when we think of the Son of Man, we think of him in human form. We think of this as a, an action or a name of humility, him identifying with us, Son of Man. And it is to some extent, but he also knew that these people in first century would know that that's a direct quote from the prophet David. And David, in his prophecy, explained that the Son of Man was going to come to judge the world. He was the only one that had the power to judge the world. And so when Jesus says, I am him, I'm the Son of Man, when he starts doing these miracles on Sundays on the Sabbath, and people start picking up rocks going, who do you think you are? I'm the Son of Man. And they said, that is blasphemy, my friend. That is, that is a title reserved only for a Messiah, and I know you're not him because, of course, he didn't look like a king, right? He looked like you and me. He didn't come in on a white horse wielding a, sh- wielding, wielding a shield, wielding a, a sword. He didn't look like the king they were looking for. So, of course, then they think he's a, he's a heretic and, and a crazy man, and they're like, we're, we ain't having this. We're not doing this. But he said, nope, I am him. I am the son of man. And we, of course, on this side of the Bible, we know that he was absolutely right. He was absolutely true. We know that he had all the authority given to him by his father to judge the world. And these are things that John wants you to know in his gospel. We comfortable? We worked up? You want me to get worked up? You want me to get worked up? I do stay worked up. Man, I flew through that. I flew through that and got done early. We did good. Can we pray us out? All right. Y'all ready to go do your small groups? Woo! All right, let's pray out. God, thank you for what you would have us learn today. God, I I pray over all these small groups that these women are going to get into this morning that they would have um, just a great conversation about you, that they would open their hearts to you and that uh, they would focus solely on you and what you what you showed our our brother John in his gospel, so that we could also learn from him and his example. God, um, please be with them. Please bless their conversations. Please let them go home and and want to explore more into your word, so that we can get to know you even more intimately and more deeply. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.